Online family, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Todd and we're here in my living room because our family, like probably like so many of yours, have been affected by COVID recently. Uh, we're so thankful that Whitney has recovered, but it's so likely that, that you or someone you love or a close friend has been affected. So, so we just wanna start just by praying for our community. Look, come on, this is not how we wanted to start the year, is it? I mean, it is difficult, it is challenging, and so we just wanna remember that, that we don't serve a God who runs from our pain, but Jesus is a God who suffers, and He joins us right in the midst of our pain. So would you just join me in praying for our community right now? So Jesus, this is hard. None of us wanted to start the year this way, especially not another year. And so I pray that you would just be with us. I thank you that you understand our frustration, that you understand our pain, that you understand the suffering of people who, who have lost someone, who have friends and family who are even just currently in the hospital. I, I pray for endurance for our healthcare workers. I pray for wisdom for decision makers. I mean, this is just so hard. And, and at the same time, we, we're just thankful that you're with us. And help us to remember that, that even though circumstances are less than ideal, that, that you aren't surprised by this. That, that you are comforting us, you are with us every step of the way, that, that your character and your love is constant, and, and just show us how we can love people through this season. And so we love you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. And I'm just so thankful that we know that Jesus is with us in the good times and in the hard times. Now, for all of you planners out there, I just wanna let you know uh, where we're going today. Uh, if you're like me, I like to know those things. So I'm gonna introduce our speaker and we'll get straight in the talk. And then afterwards, I'll come back and just let us know some ways that we can be involved in all Jesus is doing through his public church. So our speaker today is a great friend of mine, Matt Moore. Matt is married to Jennifer Moore and they have two incredible kids. Anna Kate is four years old, she's so precious. And her little brother Max is actually less than four months old. And, and I am just grateful that Matt is serving our community as the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, Okoye Region, FCA Director. When I think about Matt, I don't, I don't think about a title, I don't think about a position. I think about somebody who has endured a lot and yet clings to his faith and still follows Jesus. I think about somebody who, who doesn't run away from questions, but wrestles with the tough questions of faith. And, and I think about a friend who always tells me the truth, even when I don't want him to. And he tells it to me because he loves me. And come on, whether or not you follow Jesus, we all need friends like Matt. So I just invite us to lean in for this opportunity to be challenged and changed as Matt speaks. Hey, how are you? My name's Matt and you're watching this, so way to go. We made it, you made it here. I'm so glad that you found us online. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, welcome to Public Church Online. We're pumped about it, we're excited about it. So my name is Matt Moore, and Todd gave me like a very gracious introduction. And I would love at some point maybe to talk to you, uh, like social distance and safe, of course, but love to talk to you, get to know who you are. So um, I don't know, Todd, email Katie at Public Church. She would be glad to get you my contact. But listen, here's the deal. I, I know that our world and our times look different. And, and honestly, this, this last few weeks has kind of been almost like a little PTSD. And so really what I would like to do before I even get started, I just want to pray for these moments. So wherever you are, whatever you're doing, whenever you watch this, whatever you're walking through, I, I want God to use this message to be something that's encouraging to you right where you are. So would you just pray or just listen to me pray? Don't close your eyes if you're driving or doing other stuff. But I just want to lift you up where you are and, and pray for these next few moments that we're together. So God, I just thank you so much for your love for us. I thank you that you care for us. And I thank you that you know exactly where we are. God, I pray for this, for this uh, message that you've laid on my heart. God, that as I speak it, that it would be helpful to those that are listening. God, that wherever they are on their journey with you, that they would hear your heart for them. God, I pray that you use my words and use me to be able to be a helpful thing to them. God, I pray that you would also just work in me even as I speak that your spirit isn't contained by this little moment. I, I don't come as an expert, but I come as someone who's wanting to learn and to walk with you and grow with you. God, we love you. We thank you for all you do and all you are. Your name, amen. 
So I don't know, we're at the first of, of 2022, and I don't know where you've been or what your history has been when you start the new year. But sometimes there are people that love doing like, hey, what's your word for the year? And maybe that's been you. Maybe you're a word person. Maybe that's the thing. Like every year you have a different word. And that, I'll be really honest with you, that's not my thing. I've never been that. I've never had like a word for the year. But I've started this role with FCA and like everybody in FCA talks about, hey, here's, here's our word. This is my word for this last year was this, or my word for last year was that. And so as, the, as 2021 was wrapping up, what was happening was my team that I work with, which is incredible, I have an incredible team that I work with, they were talking about, hey, man, well, you know, my word for this year has been that. Hey, what's your word going to be? Hey, when we meet again in 2022, let's talk about our word. So I began thinking and praying like, well, God, I guess I have to have a word. I need to know what my word is. So God, you've never done this. I just want to figure it out. So I had a word in my head, all right? And I'm thinking about it, like, this. I've got to have one. I can't have multiple words, just one word. So I started thinking I had it. And so I went to our, our, our first team meeting of the year and we sat in the, in the circle. We meet at Okoy Coffee and we were sitting there and my team started telling me their words, man. And man, these are like holy words. These are godly words. These are like alliteration kind of words. Like they even like got, some of them like did like three, the other L like three in a row. Like one was like linger. Like I just want to linger at the feet of Jesus this year. Like one was like, listen, I just want to listen to, to other people, but I also want to listen to the Lord. Like I want to be close to him. And so when they got to my word, <laughs> I just, I was like, okay, this is not as holy as yours. Um, I said, my word is uh, uh, therapy. <laughs> they just looked at me like, Matt, what, do you need therapy? And I was like, honestly, maybe. And I'm not making a light of therapy. In fact, therapy is a good thing. If you're not doing that, it would be a good thing to be a part of. But the word therapy came to me, honestly, as I was praying through stuff, because we think about the last few years. Man, they, they've been hard. They've been difficult. It's been hard to walk through. And, and what God was really showing me was in my life, I need to move as a therapist would, I don't tell, I, he doesn't, didn't want me to go to people and say, hey, you got to be like me or come to God, do what Jesus has said. If you're not getting it right right now, you're missing the point. But what he was saying was like, Matt, you need to go beside people where they are and just be where they are. Meet them where they are and help them where they are. Don't expect more than, than to do, acknowledge the hurt that's in their life. Acknowledge where they're, where they're feeling pain or where they feel limited and speak life into them. And I'll be really real, the, the, uh, the other side of the therapy thing was like, in the last two or three years or so, I've had a really difficult time. The years have been tough on me, not just with COVID, but with other things as well. I've seen people that have been spiritual leaders, and I've, yeah, in other places, not here at public, but in other places, that just didn't lead well, that hurt a lot of people, hurt friends of mine. And it's been difficult to see that and not be in a position to help them and come alongside them. And I've had to deal with those things. And I've tried to deal with like what's been my play in that. And so there's things where I need people to come to me and meet me where I'm at, where I'm hurting, and not to be full of myself. It's like, I've got it, but I need that kind of thing. And really, the therapy thing, I said I had to pick one word, but really two words were what it was. Because the thing that came to my mind is a physical therapist. In fact, I was talking to a young lady at Bradley High School, because uh, you have to mention Bradley if you're a public church, but there is a young lady at Bradley High School who is a, um, a level 10 gymnast. And this last year, her senior year, um, instead of getting the scholarship she wanted, she had to have hip surgery. And so she said, right before Thanksgiving, she had to have one hip uh, fixed, and then right after Christmas, had to have the other hip fixed. And as I was talking to her and her family, and they were talking about how difficult that the therapy was, they're like, they're just trying to get her where she can get a little bit better. And when she gets better enough for, with the one side, they're going to do the other side. And what I realized, it reminded me of when my mother was sick, and my mother passed away in 2016, but in 2006, she had a disease that was, caused stroke-like symptoms for her, where she had really had to learn how to walk, talk, eat, all over again. And it didn't happen overnight. In fact, uh, the doctors initially thought that she would be a vegetable. We were fortunate, though, however, to be able to go to Patricia Neal uh, Neurological Rehab Center at Fort Sanders Hospital in Knoxville. And I was able to be there for like a, almost like a month and a half with her as she would go into this large therapy room every day and there were different people who would walk through different things, who had had different injuries, whether it was a car accident or whatever else. And I got to see physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists work with people. And what they never did, what they, I never saw them do was someone who, who was just learning to like even take a step again. They weren't like, okay, now I need you to walk across the room, no help. What they would say was like, hey, you're hurting, but I know what you're capable of. I know what your body's supposed to do. 
what it was made to do. So I want you just to, to wiggle your foot. Let's start with that today. All right, we're going to wiggle this foot. Let's start with that today. And we're going to do a little bit more. And then the time I was there, I would see people go from spaces where they couldn't even walk to where they were walking under their own power. I got to see that with my own mother, with a doctor who had told her that she'd, she'd be a vegetable, that we'd never go again. And said, maybe if she's in a wheelchair coming to the office, two months later, she was walking into that office. And I, and I give full credit to, of course, our incredible creator, but also the people who are willing to come beside her where she was and walk with her to help her and to help her be a little bit better. And, I, and it reminds me, I'm actually... Uh, I'll just, I'll just be real. Like, I'm not a flexible person. I do not have like limber limbs. I have a, a two month old son and he can like stick his, his head, his arm behind his head. Like, I can't do that. And we won't want to see that. That would be like banned on, online. But here's the thing is, is I'm not flexible, but I've actually been trying to do some stuff to get a little more flexible. And there's this app called Center. It's a Chris Hemsworth, not Center, but Center. And Chris Hemsworth is the guy who created it. And obviously you can tell it's working because I just look just like Chris, okay? So if you're just listening to the podcast or whatever, just trust that the person talking right now is a spitting image of Chris Hemsworth. I am Thor, okay? But here's the thing. There's a guy on there who does some who does these functional training things to help you get better and all these freeways. His name is like uh, DeRolk. I don't know if that's his real name, but that's what he calls himself. And he's a huge guy. So who's going to tell him he's not, that's not his name. But he's this Hawaiian dude and he's this huge guy. And, it, and, he, and he has this quote, he says, this, this Hawaiian proverb. And it says, if can, can. If no can, still can. So always can. The idea is, hey, if you can do it, do it. If you don't think you can do it, still try to do it. Always can. Always move forward. The goal is not like to win or lose. The goal is to always be progressing. James Clear has this incredible quote, and some of our uh, public church family actually had this on their, on their Instagram and their social feeds. Actually, the Reverb Agency had, actually had it on their thing. So they, it, was, it was a really cool thing. But I'm sure we'll post it somewhere. You'll see it. But it says, if you get 1% better each day for one year by the by the end, uh, you'll end up 37 times better than the time, by the time you're done. That is not this whole thing of like, I've got to win today. I've got to beat everybody. I've got, to, I've got to do all this thing on my own. But like, just a little bit. Move forward a little bit. Do a little step. Wiggle your toe. Do the things your body knows how to do. Move forward with what you have. And, and, and honestly, we need those kind of people in our life, don't we? We need to hear those kind of things. We need to have those people and not people that just offer short-term solutions. And God isn't saying, I want you to just do a short-term thing. He's not pushing you from Sunday to Sunday or from event to event or from camp to camp or whatever your spiritual journey has looked like. God's plan for you is a long, lifelong pursuit of Him and a lifelong journey with Him. He's not creating some codependent relationship with you. That's not his goal, but he wants his life and your life to be intertwined. Like the therapist walking beside my mom. Like the, like the person who's help, helping you along the way. He wants that. But here's the thing, and, and this is what my problem is, and it may be your problem too. We often don't ask for help. And we don't ask for help, we settle. And when we settle, we go for what is easiest. We go for, for things that are, are maybe even good things, but not the best things. The things that we think we can control, the things that feel best to us. And there's actually a passage in scripture that, that you're gonna see because I want, I want you to see this is our natural human tendency. Even in our most spiritual, closest moments, we can have these things where we just, we wanna go to the easiest place. And it even looks like a good place. Now, as a church, public church has been reading through the gospels. And this story is actually found in Luke 8, but it's also in Mark 5. So for you guys who've been reading, I want to really go through the book, the Mark passage of this. And uh, so in Mark 5, uh, you may be familiar, you may not be familiar, but there's this passage where Jesus is with his disciples and they travel across the lake and they get off the boat. And there's a man that meets them or they see him coming when they get off the boat. And this man has a reputation. He's actually demon-possessed. Now, if you don't know about demon possession, I don't know a whole lot about it. I've never actually feel like I've seen it. Uh, you can ask Todd about it. Pastor Todd knows everything about it. So feel free to shoot him an email or talk to Katie at Public Church. I don't know everything about it. But what I do know is this man was hurting and he was oppressed. 
Now, I used to, as I grew up and heard this story, because I grew up in the church world, I hear this story, I thought, well, this man's just crazy. And it made sense that he was gone. But, but I heard a message from a guy named Aaron Coe just this week talking about this very passage. And when he talked about it, it really it made this man not just a demon-possessed person, but he was a human. He was oppressed by a lot of things going on in his life. Because the village, the people in the village, the people in town said, shoved him away. They said, we don't want you around us anymore. You're crazy. There's something wrong with you. And they tried to like chain him up and he broke the chains. He did all this stuff. He was actually naked when, they, when Jesus sees him. He has no clothes on. He had been in the cemetery and in the, in the caves and he was cutting himself because he was wanting his life to be over. He was isolated. He didn't know what to do. The last human interaction he probably had was people telling him to get away from him. And here he is showing up, Jesus on his shoreline, and he runs to Jesus. And his words are, don't hurt me. Because the last interactions he's had with any other human has probably been, don't hurt me, or hurting him. And here he is with Jesus saying, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. And so we see this man who ever, the whole society had rejected who comes to Jesus and, and Jesus removes the demons from him and puts them in the, the, the pigs that are, the herd of pigs that are on the hillside. And the pigs didn't care for the demons that much and the demons jump into the lake and they're all dead. But this man, the headline isn't pigs dead. The, the headline is man restored. Man who's been made whole again. Man who's been saved from this this oppression. He's no longer isolated and pushed away. But Jesus said, I want, I love you and you're whole now. But the people weren't very happy. The people who saw this man do all these things and they see Jesus get rid of the pigs and the demons. They're like, hey, Jesus, we just need you to leave. We need you to get out of here. It's been cool, but get out. We love it, but get out. And so we pick up in verse 18, and as Jesus was getting onto the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. And that makes so much sense, doesn't it? The easiest thing in that moment was for this man to say, let me get in the boat. I want to be with you. You love me. You've restored me. Everyone here hates me because of the pig situation, and I also did some crazy things when I was demon-possessed. It's like, it's not a good scene. Let me hop in the boat with you, right? Right? And so he begged, he did the things that you and I would do. It seems like the best choice, but Jesus had another plan. Verses 19 and 20, it goes on, it says, but Jesus said, no, go home to your family and tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. So the man started off to visit the 10 towns of that region and began to proclaim the great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed at what he told them. Here's what's neat. Jesus did not like spark and kick him off the boat, okay? That's not the picture. He's like, nah, get out of here. I'm done with you too. Jesus knew what this, this man's story. He knew him completely. And he knew the power of this man's story was much more powerful in the town he was in than in the boat with Jesus. Jesus knew his story and knew what he was capable of and knew what he was meant to be and what, his, what he had done So Jesus knew the impact, and what we see is that impact's told because he goes from town to town, the towns that he had been the crazy man in, now he's like, hey, remember me, crazy guy? Jesus has changed my life. The easy thing is to get back in the boat. The difficult thing is to go face the people who used to know him, the people that ran away, but God got the most glory from the difficult thing. But it wasn't because he did this because it was easy, it was because it was hard, but we get caught up in a thing that I like to call low-hanging fruit. Now, you might have heard that that word before, low-hanging fruit, in the business world, other places. And honestly, low-hanging fruit is the easiest thing for us to do, right? It's the easiest thing for us to grab. It's the easiest thing for us to, to find and do. And for some of us, the easiest thing is like resting. Like, I would rather just go take a nap. Or I'd rather, I can watch Netflix all day. Or I can watch YouTube trails. I can find out everything about everything. I can put off that paper till later. That's the low-hanging fruit. But for others of us, the low-hanging fruit is just being busy, doing lots of work, doing lots of stuff because you feel most comfortable there. Because you can stay busy enough, you never have to like face your emotions or face things or even try to rest because you're scared of what might happen if you did. So what we do is like, 
just run after stuff and, and chase after stuff. And it's a low-hanging fruit. We gather lots of things, but it's not good. Now, you might be asking, well, why is low-hanging fruit bad? Well, in the agricultural world, I, I, I did some research on this and, and tried to find out, well, why would it be bad? What would be a thing that would be a problem? So there's a few little things. The first is this. The low-hanging fruit is not the best fruit on the tree. In fact, the best fruit on the tree is a little bit higher. It's the higher stuff that you just can't reach by jumping up and down. It's, it's, it's the stuff that gets the sunlight a little bit better. It gets riper a little bit sooner. I remember when I went, went when I was in college on a trip to Mexico on a mission trip, and we stayed at this church, and they had these big, huge mango trees there. Well, the guy that was our trip leader, he loved fruit, man, so he was just grabbing all the fruit that he could get to right there, and he was just eating like mango after mango after mango. And he's like, oh, these are so good. And then our host guy came out and was like, oh, no, no, no. Let me help you. He gets this big, huge, long stick that has like a little basket on the end, has like a little razor on the thing, and he starts plucking up these ripe fruit from the top of the tree. And then the rest of us began eating those things. The rest of us really enjoyed our fruit, not only then, but later in the week. Our friend who ate all the green fruit that was on the low end did not enjoy his night that night, and maybe a few days later has some issues. If you don't understand, ask your mom, okay? She'll tell you more about it. Here's the thing, the low-hanging fruit is easy to get, but it's not the most beneficial. It's not the best fruit. The other side of this, too, is that animals and bugs love the low-hanging fruit. It's where they like to gather. If you're picking blackberries, just a a hint, just a thing, don't grab the ones at the bottom. You know why? Because when your dog is walking by those, guess what he likes to do? He likes to... uh, Take a little pee pee on those. I don't know if I can say pee pee, but we're online. We'll edit it out or they'll just bleep that, okay? But whatever the thing is, it's like they, it's not the best place to get it. It's not the best thing. And here's the third thing if you talk to someone who owns an orchard, what they will tell you is start at the top of the tree, fill your basket with the fruit that's good first, and then work your way down because you're not lifting a heavy load to get to the top. If you feel your low-hanging fruit first and then start going to the top of the tree, guess what? You're wearing yourself out. So by the time you get to the end of the day, you're spent and you may not even get the best stuff. But if you start at the top and work your way down, your, your load is getting heavier, but it's getting lighter and easier because you're on your way down. But we have this tendency to want to do stuff on our own. We have this tendency. I have that tendency to do that. I have a friend of mine, actually, funny story. You may be familiar with this person. You may not. His name is Todd. He's actually in the room with me right now. And so I hope he doesn't just stop this whole thing. But um, but we were a few weeks ago when it was like end of December and we had rain and it was like 70 degrees or whatever. Todd calls me. He's like, hey, I need to clean my gutters out. Do you have a ladder? And I was like, absolutely, I do. But it's old. It's an aluminum ladder. It's really good but it will bring you closer to Jesus once you like extend it out because it just wiggles. You won't fall, but it will wiggle. You need to have somebody to hold it for you. And I was like, I'll do it. I'll, I'll, I'll come down the whole ladder. He's like, I got to watch the boys right now. When Whitney gets back, I'll get her to help me. So great. No worries. A few days later pass by and I see Todd again. And again, it's December. It's, I don't know, like 60, 70 degrees. And I see Todd and he's wearing shorts. And he's got like scrapes on his leg and like a scrape on his arm. Like, Todd, what happened? Was it like a shaving accident? What occurred? He's like, well, there's a little story. (laughs) And so he begins to tell me, he's like, hey, you know, when he came home, I got on the ladder and I went ahead and got to like the high stuff first. I worked my way around the house. I was, I was knocking it out. I was brave. I'm no longer scared of heights. I'm feeling good. I get to the back deck, which is the shortest stuff to get to. I, I, I put the ladder down. I get up there and I start to reach over to get, I mean, it's not even that far. I just got to reach over and clean this gutter out, man. No problem, almost done. And then it dawns on me, hmm, I bet that deck is a little wet. And it was, and there was no one there to help him. And as the ladder began to slide out from underneath him and crash through his his glass door on the porch, and as Whitney is standing on the other side of the porch saying, what's happening? And then Todd falls and falls with his back like a dead roach on on this ladder. And he's laying there. And when he's like, is my husband dead? And then he like moves. He's okay. But they had to get a new door. Here's the thing. We, it's not the best thing. In fact, it's the worst thing that we can have happen is to do something on our own and not fail, but to have some kind of success. And then we start stacking up these low hanging fruit successes and wins but it's at the detriment to a bigger loss down the way. 
And time and time again, we stack up these wins in our mind that we can do, that we can fail, that, or we can't fail. We can continue to do things. Look how much I've done. Look how much I can do. And then at the end, we're worn out. We're tired. We're broken. We're wondering what could happen. And when there's people right around us that we could just say, hey, could you hold this for me? But we're doing so good, we don't want the help. And if, even, if you, if, even if you're the rest person, you do very little, or if you are like, do it all and you do the best, you're, we're, we're going to be limited. You can't do it on your own. You're not meant to. We're not meant to. Jesus, who created us, tells us we're not meant to. But he tells us that we're not going to be alone. Throughout Scripture, he reminds us that he is meant to walk with us. We were built, made to walk with him in our lives. And he has promised us that he's never going to leave us and forsake us. In Matthew 28, 20, this is exactly what he says uh, as Jesus is going, is about to ascend into heaven. And Jesus has told these people, like, you're going to do greater things than, than I have, but you're not doing them greater things because, because you're greater than me, you're going to do greater things because I'm going to be lifting you up. I'm going to be empowering you and giving you strength. So Matthew 28, 20, uh, he's about to ascend into heaven. And he says, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He is promising his presence. This is not an empty statement. This is not something you say, like some peaceful little thing, like, hey, I want to make you feel good before I leave. He is reaffirming what he has said in Scripture already before this, what he has told them in conversations over meals and saying, I'm going to be with you. I'm not leaving you. In fact, in John 16, we see this as he's, he's, they've just had the Last Supper, and he's re encouraging them about how he's going to be with them. In John 16, verse 13 through 15, he says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth and he will not speak on his own but he will tell you what he has heard and he will tell you about the future he will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me God's still getting the glory he is the one speaking through it right so all that belongs to the father is mine so he is bringing in God the father God the son Jesus and he's bringing the Holy Spirit in and he's saying all that belongs to the father is mine that is why I said the spirit will tell you whatever he receives to me from me that he is guiding us to truth. He's not yelling truth from the mountaintop and say, figure it out. He is a guide. He is walking beside us. He is coming with us. He's not this empty presence. He's not, and then God is not some stalker waiting for you to fail or waiting for you to mess up or watching you from the outside and say, well, you didn't do it right. God is saying, I want to be with you. I am going to guide you to truth. And that truth and what he's guiding to is not weakness. What he's giving us and what he's giving us is strength. In John, or 1 John 4, 4, it says, but you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people. And that those people he's talking about, what John's talking about in this, are people who are detracting from God's word and saying that he's not real. He's not the thing. And, and, and what he's saying is like, but you have already won victory over these people because the spirit who lives in you, my spirit, which I promise you, which I've told you about, which is, I've said, I'm never leaving you for sake of you. That spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. He gives us strength. He lifts us up. We are not weaker, but stronger because of his ever present help. When we try to do more, it is a sin. The try hard life of faith, trying to do more, trying to impress, I'm going to do all the stuff, I'm going to be holier than anybody else, I'm going to do all the things I need to do, that is when our faith becomes an idol, because it's faith in us, not in Him. The spirit that He's put in you and I, if we're believers in Him, we surrender our life to Him, is meant to help us be what we're capable of, not do more. He looks at us and creates us in this way, right? So we have to make a decision to move past the, the low-hanging fruit. We have to move past this thing of wanting to grab the things we can do. And I think there's three things. These are not definitive. There's no scientific proof of this, but I believe Scripture points to this. There's three things that we have to embrace. The first is this, is we have to be willing to surrender. We have to be willing to surrender. And, and Luke 9, 23 Jesus is really clear about this. He says to the crowd, he says, if anyone wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. I love how the New Living says this, that 
You must give up your own way, what you want to do. You must give up what you want, the thing that you think, the low-hanging fruit, the thing that you think you're really successful at. God says, I want to use that in a whole other way. You must be willing to give up your own way and take up your cross daily. Not on Sundays only. Not at retreats or camps or, you know, every few years when you start feeling guilty. But daily, there is a need for us to embrace him daily because we need his strength daily. Because there is an enemy against us who's trying to make us move another direction, who's trying to say, do more or do less, but never depend on him. So take up your cross daily and follow me. We must surrender. The second thing is this. We must be willing to embrace being uncomfortable. We must be willing to embrace being uncomfortable. And throughout Scripture, again and again, God shows this as his pattern of moving us from the place. And like the therapist, right? The therapist has you wiggle your toes, but you're not wiggling your, t- your toes the whole time because you'll never walk. You're go- if you've ever done physical therapy, some of you have had this and you understand, I don't like my therapist. I don't like going, but you love being able to walk out of the place. Some of us in our Christian life and pursuing God are just wiggling our toes, doing, the, doing stuff that we should, our bodies can do but not what our bodies are meant to do. God's pushing us to be uncomfortable. And we see this in Scripture over and over. I, and I'll mention a few, like there's a, there's a guy named Gideon in the Old Testament. Gideon was hiding, trying to grow fruit and har- or not fruit, but harvest grain in a pit and hiding from God. And God says, I have something different for you than hiding. I want to make you a deliverer of my people. We have Moses in the Old Testament who murders a guy in Egypt 40 years, he's out like herding sheep, and he has a whole new life plan that has him never going back to Egypt. In fact, I'm sure Egypt never crossed his mind except in his nightmares when he thought about the person he used to be and what he did and why he left and why he was hiding. And God finds him there. He never lost him, but calls him there in that space and says, I'm calling you to free my people. I'm going to use you in your weakness. You're going to be strong. And I'm, you're going to lead my people and free them. We see, again, a guy named Abraham in Scripture. You're f- maybe familiar with him. Abraham, man, he had everything going on. Abraham is like the guy in the city of Ur. He has money. He has power. He has influence. And God says to him, hey, Abraham, I've got something better for you. But you're going to have to go where I send you, and you don't know where that's going to be. Do you trust me? I'm going to give you a family. Your descendants will be like that in the stars. And Abraham has to make a choice. I'm leaving this space and going somewhere else. In, in the New Testament, you, you've maybe heard of a guy named Saul who was turned to Paul. Saul knew everything that there was to know about God. And as far as the Jewish faith knew, he was the expert. He'd been trained by the best. He knew the best. He knew it backwards and forwards. He believed in that so much that he was willing to persecute people who believed in Jesus and throw them in jail and have them killed. And on the road to Damascus, Jesus stops him and says, why are you persecuting me? And blinds the man and says, now that you're blind, I want you to go now engage some people that are believers in Jesus and say, hey, I need your help. Uncomfortable. There's a guy named Peter. You may be familiar with Peter. Now, the low-hanging fruit in Peter's story would be the one that most of us have been familiar with where or Peter, Jesus uh, and Peter are encountering each other on the water and Peter's in the boat, Jesus is not in the boat, and Peter's like, hey, can I come to you? And he falls in the boat, or, or, or steps out, and are like, yeah, Peter has faith, all this stuff. <clears throat> That's a low-hanging fruit story for this one. In the book of Acts, Peter has already preached this incredible message to the people, and thousands come to the Lord. He's, he's going around and sharing more about who God is to Jewish people, and there's a moment where God has to intervene in his life, because one of the things that Peter was, was someone who thought that following Jesus was just for a certain race of people. That the Jewish people were the only ones who needed to know Jesus. And they were the only ones that Jesus really wanted to save. But if Peter had been paying attention throughout Jesus' ministry, he's, he's turning over tables saying, my house is a house of prayer for all nations. And then when he sends them out, he's saying, I'm sending you to the uttermost parts of the earth. And it wasn't just for the Jewish people. It was for everyone. And so Jesus made Peter really uncomfortable because he comes to him in a dream and says, you've got to go to this guy named Cornelius and you're going to, he's a Gentile. He doesn't look like you or act like you. In fact, your tradition tells you you can't even be with this person. 
in his home, and Peter is told, you've got this where you have to go. And when he goes, guess what? He's uncomfortable, but God gets the glory. God is pushing us to these uncomfortable places. God is moving us toward those things. Not because he's mean or twisted or has some other agenda. He's doing that because he knows what we're capable of. What we're meant to be. Not to do what we're meant to be. Because the third thing, the third thing we have surrender. We have to be willing to embrace the uncomfortable. But the third thing is we have to be willing to move where he is. It doesn't do you any good if you're walking in therapy and the person, the therapist is walking with you and you're like, you know what? I probably got this. I'm just going to walk on this side. I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'll just hang out over here because that's when you fall. He's saying, move with me where I'm going. He's calling you to be what you're meant to be, not do. You're created for it. In fact, in, in Genesis 1.27, there's a reminder of this, right? Genesis 1.27 says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God created you and me. He knows exactly what we're meant to be and what we're meant to do from the inside out. He knows everything about us. And he says, we're created in his image, not our image. Not the thing that Instagram or TikTok or whatever else is telling you. His image, exactly how he wanted you to be. You will feel most like you when you are most like him. It's not pretend, it's not doing, it's being. And he is shaping us and forming us and who we're meant to be. In, in Matthew, the book, book of Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, there's, there's some verses there that I think that, that kind of encapsulate this whole thought of what he's calling us into when he's telling us to surrender, when he's saying embrace the uncomfortable, and when he says, like, move like I am. In Matthew eleven twenty eight verse 28, it says this, is, Then Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. You've been trying to carry the hanging fruit, quit carrying those burdens, I will give you rest. And some of us stop at the rest part, like, this is all I need to know. I just want to rest. The Bible says rest. Let me rest. Can I rest? Would you rest? Take a rest. But that's not where he ends it. He says, take my yoke upon you, meaning there's going to be some work to do. But the work I'm leading you to is what you were meant for. Let me teach you. Let me come beside you. Let me show you. Because I'm humble and I'm gentle at heart. You will find rest for your souls. Maybe this is the first time you've heard that God is humble and gentle. Maybe this is, you've been working so hard to try to prove yourself to him and to other people around you. And you need to know that he's humble and he's gentle at heart. And the anguish you feel in your soul when you come to church, when you've heard about God, there's a freedom that he wants to give you. It says in verse 30, for my yoke is easy to bear. The burden I give you is light. Quit picking the low-hanging fruit. I've built you and I've made you to enjoy this life. It may be difficult, but I'm with you. It's going to be uncomfortable, but I'm with you. I've given you, I've made you with a purpose and a reason to walk through this life. And I want to show you how to move. I want to show you how to live that life. And it's not just for one moment, but it's for your lifetime. There's a freedom to walk in the way we're meant to be. You will feel most like you when we are more like him. There's legend of the Crusades, and the Crusades is probably like the worst example anybody could use. It's like, hey, let's talk about Christianity, Crusades. But there's legends of the Knights of the Templar, these, these, these warriors that were, thought they were moving in the way of God to, to, to win back some things, and, and, and you can dig into that history. But legend tells of these knights of the Templar, before they went, they were, thought they were doing the right thing for God. And they wanted to be, they, they decided that we will be baptized. We'll be baptized before we go, so God will bless what we're doing. And as legend tells, they would get baptized and they would be immersed in the water, and every part of their body would be covered except for their sword, which they'd hold above the water. Because the thing they were doing, the violence they wanted to bring onto the earth, God, I don't think you can bless that. So just let me have this. 
And I heard that story and I thought to myself, how many times is God calling me to something and I'm still holding on to stuff because I feel like I'm doing all the right things, but I'm holding on to the wrong things. God's calling us to surrender, to embrace the uncomfortable, embrace being uncomfortable, and to move more like him, not out of guilt or shame or anything else, but because he wants all of us, because we're meant to move in this world like him. It's not always easy, but we always can be a little more like him. We always can, and if if no can, still can, because he's forgiving, he's full of grace, and he's full of mercy for us. He is beside us and walks beside us through every part of our life. And for some of us, we just need to start moving a little bit. And I, I, I can't speak to this and not think that people are hearing this online, wherever you are, that you've been hurting, you've had difficulties, you've had hard times. And for some of you, you just need to stop and praise God because he's been with you and you've known it. For some of you, you're listening and you're like, I am holding on to some real things. Surrender is not my jam. It's not what I want to do. For some of you, you're like, I want to surrender. I've heard, you're telling me about Jesus that I want to surrender to. If that's you, man, I, I, I pray that right now you just cry out to Jesus and say, God, I, I, Jesus, I give you my heart. I want to know this Jesus that the Scripture actually talks about. I want to have this life that's easier than, and not easy, but easy because you're with me because you're going to give me strength. I want that kind of life that's full. I want to be the person you've made me to be. If that's you, then, then where you're at, Cry out for that. And we're going to have some ways later to, share, to tell you how to connect and, and, and to know him. And we're going to surround you with a community of people that want to come beside you right where you are too. For some of you, what's going to need to happen is you're going to have to, to really evaluate your life and say, am I just wiggling my toes here? Do I need to get a little uncomfortable? Do I need to like, go to some friends that I've hurt in the past? Do I need to, to do some things to, to apologize to my boss or apologize to my spouse or maybe even to my kids? of how I've treated, I've been really busy with stuff and I've not been really present with you. I promise you that uncomfortable thing is is probably really on your head right now. You're really thinking about it. Step into that and know you're not alone in it because God's heart is to make you more like him. My prayer for, for you today is that you're not trying to win it all today. You're just a little bit today. Give him your heart today. Move a little bit more. Daily pursue. Daily fall in love with him. Daily see this Jesus who loves you so much. I want to pray for you. And then we're going to have a few more moments here uh, to hear about what, how you can be involved and how God can continue to work through you and get you connected to the community. So, Father, I thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you for what you've done for us, Lord. Thank you for this holy moment just to be here and to be able to speak and to share that this message that, that you've given us through scripture of your heart and who you are is completely and definitively life-giving and that we would just embrace it and remember it and remember it and remember it. God, we pray for your presence. I pray for your presence just to continue to be with us beyond these moments because that's your promise. Help us see it. Help us see it. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for all you do, everything you are. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Matt, thank you for that powerful and challenging word. And look, if you have any questions about following Jesus or something Matt said, or you just want prayer, email prayer at publicchurch.com. Our prayer team would love to connect with you and pray with you. And I'm just gonna end our time by sharing some ways that we can be connected with all Jesus is doing through his public church. And the first way is through generosity. There's going to be some ways to give on the screen, but the real question is why do we give? See, our generosity fuels life change. Our generosity creates environments where people can be transformed by studying God's Word together. It creates environments where men and women can find the friend that they need to walk through this season. And our generosity goes all the way across the world to a church we partner with in Romania who is on the ground fighting human trafficking. Come on, what a privilege to give, knowing that our generosity fuels life change. So now a little bit about those environments and about that church in Romania. 
college students, College Nights is back next Sunday, January 23rd, 6.30 p.m. on our campus. And the rumor is it's gonna be tacos and trivia. Hey, what a way to kick off the semester. Also, we are having an interest meeting for our Romanian mission journey next Sunday, January 23rd, following the 1115 gathering. Whitney and I have been to Romania. Several people in our church family have been there. And let me tell you, Jesus is using this church to push back the darkness there. And if you want to hear from their incredible lead pastor, Horia Pope, you can just go to our Instagram at a public church where we have a video from Horia. Also, guys and ladies, we are having Guys Not In and Galentines on February 11th at 6.30. Uh, we're gonna have more details coming, but the real question is, well, why should you come? Well, ladies, Galentines is on our campus and it is an opportunity for you to form and deepen authentic relationships and you're gonna have dessert. And who doesn't love dessert? Come on. I mean, this is gonna be a special night for you ladies. And guys, why should you come? Because we're gonna build forts and have Nerf Wars. Come on, it'll be at the studio and we'll be sharing that address and more details later on. So thank you so much for joining us today. If you have any questions from today, email katie at publicchurch.com. She's phenomenal and she can either answer your question or connect you with a person who can. So we just want you to know that Jesus is for you and we are for you. And we hope to see you back next week.